This is a short follow-up to a video I made roughly a year and a half ago. I had talked about the history of the Raggedy Ann musical, from its origins as a trippy animated film, to its successful reception in Moscow, to its incredibly short run on Broadway. It was a tantalizing thing to fans of lost media and obscure musicals, since there was a decent amount of material available on the subject, including low-quality audio of one of the Broadway performances, but of course, we wanted more. And just a few days ago, a full video of one of the early performances was uploaded. Not only that, but it's fully subtitled if you have any issues making out some of the dialogue. It's all here aside from some minor difficulties with the video when Raggedy Ann first comes to life. I was put in contact with a correspondent, one of the people involved in recovering the video, who wishes to be credited as Brooklyn or Finishing the Hat. She says that the original video file skips a few seconds of footage early on with no explanation, so perhaps there are some camera issues. That brief moment is bridged with audio from the Broadway show and a bit of footage from the Russia performance. But other than that, this is a complete performance, and it's been a holy grail for the fans the show has gained over the years. At this time, a number of different drafts of the musical script have apparently been found. Based on a timeline Brooklyn provided, this is one of the earliest versions of the book, performed in 1984. After this is when they believe the demo recordings were produced, all of which can be found on YouTube. The Moscow performance followed, and the curtains rose and quickly fell on Broadway after that. That means that this is the version where the bugs are still getting worked out, to some extent. A lot of my plot descriptions I did in my initial video were based on the Broadway audio, so there are certain discrepancies. Some of the songs are earlier drafts, for example. The Bats song is You'll Never Get Away in this performance, whereas the Broadway version rewrote it as You'll Love It. The gist is the same, but the Broadway version has her directed solely at Raggedy Andy, while the earlier version had her singing to taunt everyone. According to Brooklyn, this was one of the performances that got flack from a vocal mother in the audience for being too dark. Despite that, the retooled version of the show didn't change all that much of the scary stuff in the end. This version has a moment where General D makes the heroes listen to doomed animals in the slaughterhouse, which was cut later on. The scene where Raggedy Ann innocently helps Marcella's mother tie a noose in the forest was also shortened quite a bit in later performances. Now having seen the show in full, I can say it was just what I was hoping it would be. However, I can also say that I understand why it didn't fly with family audiences. I don't want to be one of those people who says that kids can't handle something dark or sad. I mean, in previous videos I've said just the opposite. But a lot of this show was pretty spooky and bleak. I've talked before about how I respect when kids' media takes its audience seriously, but there still needs to be a balance between light and dark. If I had seen this as a child, I think I would have been pretty upset. I'll restate what I said about the show in my first video. If they had retooled it to be a dark fantasy geared toward a more adult audience, I think it would have done better. Maybe not on Broadway in the 80s, but the small yet devoted cult following the show has gained proves that there is certainly an audience for it out there. The script was smart. I liked Raggedy Ann trying to cheer up Marcella while doubting her own abilities to fix everything. As much as I love Dee Dee Khan's performance in the original movie, I found Ivy Austin's take to be just as endearing. Although Khan and Austin are playing the same character, the stage Raggedy Ann has a lot more hardships to face, more than just taffy monsters and amorous pirates. Thus, the way she was performed had to be different. Visually, the show had some great effects. The giant all-seeing eye of General D, Marcella's house getting destroyed, the branches shaped like skeletons in the grizzly woods. Some of it was even better than what I had imagined. The camel costume was impressive, especially with how it could blink, but it looked remarkably cumbersome for the actor, especially having to wear it for most of the show. A big treat was the relatively clean audio. The demo recordings of the songs are mostly a piano and some synths with clear-ish vocals. There's some static, but it's possible to remove it. What's not as clear is the Broadway audio, which is understandably muffled with a lot of audience chatter. It was nice to hear the songs with the proper orchestrations and decent quality. I had been rather harsh on the stereotypical depiction of the panda character in the original video, and actually seeing how the character functioned in the show made me like him more. I still wish they had toned down the heavy accent, but I like how the panda acted as the smart member of the group. 
a guide that understood how some of the strange rules of their dream world worked. I was also really impressed with General D's character. He was a great villain. His weird, rambling monologues about recruiting people for his deathly cause were wonderful. He was absolutely insane, and I imagine he was a fun character to create. That being said, his infatuation with Marcella was still super creepy, and I understand why parents might not have cared for that specific aspect. Even I had to shudder at a couple points. Also, he appears to be a giant rat in this version, with a nose, whiskers, and tail. According to Brooklyn's notes, the rat appearance was in one of the early scripts, but was dropped shortly afterward. Brooklyn notes that the book's playwright, William Gibson, was fond of the rat design and was unhappy to see it go. Later versions had Marcella's father explicitly mention that her mother left with a rat in a Rolls Royce, and the rat himself apparently appeared in the heaven scene in later productions, most likely as a chance to get the large rat on stage. What Gibson's obsession with a rat man was, we may never know, but it's certainly an interesting tidbit. There were changes made to the later drafts of the show that I think were made for the better. Speaking of the heaven sequence, for example, it seems like a strange, random detour in this early version. The gang escapes General D's evil shark form in the ocean and fly into the clouds to see a long dance number done by celestial beings. It's visually interesting, but it doesn't really add much to the story, other than bringing in more melancholy death themes when Marcella briefly muses about the afterlife. Later drafts added an appearance by Marcella's bird, and her being able to see her mother and father happy again for a moment before being broken apart. In my own personal opinion, those choices really saved the scene. Other changes included the Doctor's song. This early performance has them don clown wigs and sing their diagnosis song before the fever dream. I think making the song itself part of a dream helped differentiate reality and fantasy. It's a minor thing, but Marcella's bird is named Tweety in this performance, and was shortly after changed to Yellow Yum Yum. As silly as the new name is, calling the bird Tweety was even more distracting for me, since I kept picturing the Looney Tunes character. The wolf sings the big villain song in this performance called He Comes Riding. It was later changed to I Come Riding, and sung by General D in the hospital scene near the end, to a better and creepier effect. The song Mexico was eventually replaced by Make Believe. Although Mexico is arguably a better song, it was most likely a little confusing to the audience, wondering why the dolls were heading to Los Angeles, but singing about going south of the border. One small thing that was changed for Broadway that I liked better in this version was the placement of the camel's big song, Blue. In this version, the camel sings it as they sail across the ocean. In later versions, his song was moved to slightly earlier when they first meet him in the shipyard. I feel that the action flowed better when he sang it on the boat, but maybe that's just me. I'm just happy that the song made it into the show, since it's one of my personal favorites. There's also more emphasis on the camel helping out during the Would You Like a Little Music song in rewrites. Apparently, there might be more footage of the show out there, and efforts are being made to contact the people who could have it. Personally though, as wonderful as finding that could be, I'm very happy with what we have here. I hope that this footage will help the show gain the appreciation that it always deserved.